spotlight myself for everybody. And hello and welcome everybody. And tonight's class is called the catchy title of Understanding how neck pain is a whole body issue. So I think I've been doing Agoski method things for too long um, and I'm taking uh, over their very lengthy, cumbersome names of titles of exercises and things like that. So for today's class, static back setup, two yoga blocks, one yoga strap, a cushion or two to hand, and then the thing that you might not have set up um, to hand is your two towels or blankets, uh, but we don't need them straight away. And I got asked last week to do less talking. So this time I'm not going to do my screen share and talk you through the postural deviations and what we're sort of going after today. I'm going to explain it to you when we get you moving. But what we are going to do to start with is we're going to start with our standing assessment, just so we are checking in with how we feel today. So do not worry that you can't see my head. That's the least important uh, part of my body, although ironically, maybe not perhaps in a neck pain class, but for the purpose of the video, it is. So we're shaking off tension and we're just feeling like we are standing normally and being ourselves. So we are tuning into and assessing, am I in pain? That's obvious. You know, you'll know what your pain is. Am I in any tension? And the tension tends to be a little bit less obvious because it's normally superseded by the thing that hurts it a bit more. So we're just tuning into what feels stiff, what feels maybe a little bit tense. And lastly, how is imbalance presenting itself through your body? So this is more subtle yet again, but do you have more weight on one foot than the other? Have you got weight kind of evenly spread from front to back of your feet? Can you feel one shoulder or arm sort of pulling you forwards? And obviously because the theme of today's class is all about the neck and the head, do you have a sense of just how your neck and head feels? So there might be pain and tension there. You might feel that your shoulders are kind of up around your ears. You might have a sense that your head is quite forward of your shoulders. You're not trying to change anything, but you are just noticing things. Um, and hopefully you will notice that you feel quite different when we finish. So we're taking things nice and simple and gentle today. That doesn't mean you're not going to be challenged, but we're taking things easy because in my experience, people that tend to have neck pain it can be like the most volatile pain within the body so it's the one that's most easily triggered and it's the one that can last for the longest amount of time afterwards as well so we are starting off with static back and feel free to do normal static back if you want to but I'm going to add a yoga block and I'm putting mine on quite a high setting um, but you might find this a little bit too extreme so feel free to put it on a lower setting if you need to but I'm putting my yoga block and the kind of corner of it at the edge of my skull so I'm not putting the yoga block underneath my neck like this I'm putting the yoga block on the edge of my skull and it's really trying to kind of create length down the back of my neck. So I'm sort of tucking my chin in and the back of my neck is long rather than my head being supported fully by the um, yoga block. And then I'm kind of tilting my head backwards. We're really trying to get the edge of your skull being supported by the block. And that is going to stretch. Again, I said at the beginning, your levator or levata, I don't know how to say it, your levata scapula muscle, which very much sounds like a Harry Potter spell. We've got palms facing upwards and we're externally rotating our arms when we do that. So when the palms are facing upwards, your humerus, your upper arm bone um, rotates within the shoulder socket. And that's just going to help open out your shoulders and your thoracic area a little bit more. Your legs are relaxed, your knees are relaxed, your hips are relaxed, and you're tuning into your nice, deep, diaphragmatic nasal breathing. So we're breathing in and out of our nose, sending that breath into our belly. We're trying to expand the belly forwards. We're trying to expand the lower back down onto the ground. We're trying to expand the ribs out to the side. We're trying to get this kind of 360 um, degree 
uh, breath work going on. We're making sure that as time goes on, we're not starting to tilt our head backwards. We're really trying to tuck that chin in and you'll feel, you might actually feel a stretch down the back of your neck, but even if you don't feel a stretch down the back of your neck, you'll sort of feel how the back of your neck feels long. And we're just gonna stay here breathing. Have I set a timer? Yes, I have. We're gonna stay here breathing for about five minutes. And I'm just gonna walk you through my kind of two intentions of what we're gonna work on today in class. So this class is understanding neck pain as a whole body issue. And we won't be doing any other neck, di like direct neck exercises other than the one that we're doing right now. So actually your head being in this position isn't so much about it stretching your neck, but it's about how this is gonna reshape your rib cage and your shoulders and how they land on the floor. So in my opinion, the two main causes of neck pain and tension are number one, a lack of shoulder function. So if your arms and your shoulder blades can't move very well, what will happen is your neck will hijack the movement that should be happening at the arms and at the shoulders. So if the shoulder blades just can't move up and down, left to right, rotate sort of forwards, backwards, likewise with the arms, if you don't have that mobility in that kind of section of your body, your neck and specifically muscles like your trapezius muscle really take over and compensate for a lack of shoulder and arm function. So number one thing that we will be thinking about today is working on our shoulders and our arms without the neck and the jaw and the head taking over. And the second thing that we're going to really think about today is the head position relative to the feet. So, Necks get extremely tense and tight if the whole body is leaning forwards like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So if you're on a diagonal from your ankles, the ankles and the feet and the hips in that instance are actually the problem, the dysfunction, and the body has to pitch forward to kind of keep you upright. You might not feel pain through your ankles and your hips and your pelvis, but your head is having to work so hard to stabilize itself. It's so wildly out of position from where it should be if it's really, really far and forwards in front of the ankles that the neck and the kind of head area can get really tense and symptomatic. But the remedy in that instance is about restoring function back to the feet and about getting the pelvis, the shoulders and the head back over the pelvis. So we're not restoring function to the feet right now, although we are going to do everyone's least favorite exercise probably next. But what we are doing here is firstly, repositioning, reshaping the thoracic region and the shoulders, but we are also getting the shoulders back over the pelvis. So in the position that you're in, yes, your head's up on the block, but your shoulders are starting to sink down to the ground and realign themselves with your pelvis. So it's hopefully going to just help with that vertical stacking of the body and how you look in the, um, in the side view. We're gonna stay here for about another minute. So just keep on breathing. If you like, you can get rid of your block. So I might get rid of my block now. And I want you just to get a sense of how your head and your shoulders feel now that you've put your head back on the floor. So what you might notice is that immediately those shoulders are rounding up away from the floor and the head is tilting backwards, which is putting that neck into cervical hyperextension. If your body is doing that and you can feel how suddenly things start sort of tensing up again and maybe the rib cage flares up, then I want you to put your head back on either the block or one of the cushions that you've got to hand. We're still trying to keep that sensation of a double chin and length down the back of our neck because that's how we are going to release and free the neck. It won't happen if the shoulders are really rounded up off the floor. So you're better off having a cushion or a block underneath your head than having a very um, sort of flexed thoracic spine. Okay, now we are going to move on to a little bit of foot function. So staying exactly where you are, your job over the course of the next few minutes is to really monitor your jaw, your neck and your breath. 
We are going to mobilize your feet and your ankles. And in my experience, the feet and the ankles are one of the most dysfunctional areas of the body when I'm working with clients and stuff like that. And there's a very apparent correlation between a lack of foot function and how the jaw neck area will start to compensate and tense up. So I'm going to keep reminding you of this, but you need to be super, super, super mindful if you notice that you're locking on through your jaw as we start to move your feet. The jaw isn't the problem. The neck isn't the problem. The feet are the problem, but the neck has learned to get involved in a movement that it's really not involved with. So we're all going to do our right side first. We're going to keep our shins, our knees, and our hips as still as we can. And we're going to circle our right foot in clockwise circles to the right hand side. So the shin stays still, the leg stays still. You're maintaining that calm breathing into the belly. Arms are facing upwards. The shoulders, the thoracic spine, the neck, and the jaw are all relaxed. And we are turning as big a circle as we can through our right foot. And as we turn this circle, focusing on the shin and the knee staying still, so the pivot point is the ankle, you're not going for speed here. You're going for the depth of movement. So you're really trying to draw big circles without moving the shin. And as you flex your foot back towards you, you're going to try and flex the toes back towards you. And as you point your foot away, you're going to try and point your toes away from you as well. So I really want you trying to stimulate the arches of your feet. Possibly you'll get cramp. That's great. Don't be alarmed if there is um, kind of clicking and crunching and stuff going on. It's normally a sign that you're moving things into better alignment and really try and get the toes involved in both directions. We're going to swap directions soon, but I just want you to tune into that jaw and your breath. Are you maintaining that nasal diaphragmatic breathing? Is your jaw relaxed and is your neck relaxed? If not, slow down the rotation of your feet a little bit. Prop your head up a bit higher so it's a bit more supported or just back off the exercise so that the neck doesn't take over. But that's really useful information for you because you're learning how your neck and head area is compensating for a lack of foot function. Okay. Relax that foot. We're going to go clockwise on, sorry, anti-clockwise on the left foot. So we're going to do exactly the same movement, but we're turning the left foot out to the left-hand side first. So we're trying to isolate the foot, keep the shin and the knee as still as possible. We're watching that we don't squeeze our hands. We're not clenching and clamping down on our jaw. The neck stays relaxed. And the back of the neck stays long as well. So just watch that those shoulders aren't creeping up off the ground and the head's tilting backwards. I'm going to set a timer here rather than do what I did before. So we'll maybe do a minute on this side to um, even out with the other side. We remember, we're trying to get the toes involved. So as we flex the foot back towards us, we try and flex the toes as well. They are a separate entity to your foot. And as you point the foot away, you're trying to point the toes away as well. And that may or may not give you a bit of an arch cramp in the sole of the foot, but that arch cramp is a good thing. And for those of you who have got neck pain and tension um, caused by foot dysfunction, this is a very powerful exercise to learn to do. So as I'm doing this now, I'm feeling a sort of popping sensation around my left rib cage. So I'm guessing that my thoracic rotation is sort of unwinding a little bit. And I'm feeling how my rib cage just is sort of settling and sinking into the floor a little bit better as I get a bit of a burn going on through my left shin. Okay. We're going to go back to that right foot and we're going to move it in the opposite way. So with the right foot this time, we're turning the foot anti-clockwise. Off we go. Watching that breath, really making sure that we're relaxing our jaw consciously. If we notice the neck creep in, and which for those of you who don't get neck tension when they do foot exercises, you're thinking I'm probably completely barking mad, but there's probably half of you who are watching this who are getting neck tension. Um, and that tells you that your foot dysfunction is causing your neck tension. So nice and slowly, shin stays still. We're not bouncing around at the knee. We are isolating the ankle and the foot. 
continuing to monitor our breath, relaxing our belly, everything pelvis upwards is relaxed. You may feel how this work at the feet feeds up the legs. You'll, well, you'll say you may feel it. You probably will be feeling shins and calves on fire. You may also be feeling your quads and possibly your hips a little bit as well. That's not wrong. It's just that connection through the leg that you are experiencing. Okay, back over to the left foot. And we're going to move the left foot clockwise this time. So isolating the ankle, turning the foot in the biggest circles that you can without pain or without moving from the knee. And remember that speed is not important here. Quality of movement is what is important. So often it is the people that are most dysfunctional in their feet that will do this super fast because they're trying to do the movement by creating momentum and like sort of racing through it. But momentum isn't muscles. Momentum is just you sort of chucking yourself around. The slower you are and the more deliberate you are with that movement of the foot, the more you're actually going to be stimulating the muscles that I want you to stimulate. So kind of back off speed. Speed isn't important. Focus on drawing nice big circles whilst the rest of you relaxes. And it's an also a really helpful exercise um, for you to decide which foot feels perhaps more clunky or unresponsive. So the side that feels like it's harder to move is probably more dysfunctional, but you might notice that one foot moves one way better than another foot moves another way, if that makes sense. You can be dysfunctional in different ways through both feet. Okay, final movement here before we move on. We're back to our right foot again, and we're gonna point and flex. So we're pulling the feet back towards us. When I used to do ballet when I was a little girl, these were my naughty toes. And then as I point the foot away, those were the good toes. And we're just moving through what we call dorsiflexion, naughty toes, plantar flexion, good toes. And this is one where you, again, you've really got to make sure that you're not bobbing up and down at the knee or the shin. It's the ankle and the foot that are just moving backwards and forwards. But the toes are also involved in the movement as well. Belly stays relaxed. Breathing stays relaxed. Arms continue to face, face up, bleh, continue to face upwards because that's just opening your shoulders and thoracic. So for those of you who've got neck pain due to shoulder dysfunction, this is kind of inadvertently helping you with that. And go for movement, really trying to point those toes so hard you get cramp in the arches of your feet. That's also the intention of our next exercise that we're going to do as well. And to the left foot. So we're pulling the left toes and the left foot back towards us, pointing the feet a foot away. Naughty toes, good toes. Naughty toes, good toes. And do make sure that you're not just moving your toes as you do this. So it's possible, I see some people, they keep their foot rigidly still and they're just flexing their toes a tiny bit. You're really trying to change the ankle of the front, or the, sorry, the top of your foot relative to your shin. So I'm getting some form of sort of shoulder release at the moment. So I know that for me, one of my dysfunctions in my body is I've got tibial torsion through my left leg. And when I work my left foot, especially in dorsiflexion, it does something to my pelvis, which releases off my rib cage a bit more. And I can feel my right shoulder repositioning itself. And I'm getting like a little bit of a rush of blood to my eternally cold hands. Cool, brilliant. So that is our start, nice and gentle. Well. Your feet might be on fire, but you're hopefully feeling fairly relaxed in your upper body. We're going to take the chair to one side for the moment. And I'm going to ask everybody here to make sure that they have um, a cushion, possibly two, underneath their head for the next exercise. You are also going to need your yoga strap around your thighs like so. So I've got my yoga strap in a circle. And when I squeeze out against the yoga strap, my knees stay at hip width apart. So they're not too narrow and they're not too wide. Okay. So we've got nice hip width alignment through my legs. Just going to move my, uh, my odds and sods to the other side. And then I'm popping the yoga block the long way round 
in between my feet. So I've got the length of the yoga block in contact with the length of my feet. So from the front, it looks like this. Okay, so head on pillows, same reason as why we had the block in that first exercise. It's just helping to lengthen and relax your neck, but it's also going to help you stay grounded through the bottom of your rib cage in this exercise. So our palms are facing back up again, and we're sort of getting a little sense of our shoulder blades. So can we pull our shoulder blades slightly back and down behind us? And you'll feel how it kind of gently, well, maybe not gently, but it sort of opens up the front of your chest where the arms meet the shoulders. We're in a hook lying position. We've got a strap around our thighs, and we've got that block along the edges inside our feet. I want you to tune into your kind of torso region here. So I want your rib cage to feel grounded on the floor. If it doesn't, number one, more cushions are needed. Or secondly, bring your feet a little bit closer to your um, bottom. So the further your feet are away from your body, the more hip mobility you have to have to be able to do this correctly. So your lower back and your rib cage should feel nice and grounded on the floor. What we're going to do to start with is just maintain an extremely gentle squeeze out against the strap um, around our thighs. So I'm squeezing my knees outwards and holding that contraction there. And what that is doing is waking up the sides of my legs and into my hips. I'm literally doing this at sort of like a two or three out of 10. OK, so the intention of what we're going to do next is not about your um, you know, you really, really squeezing out and fighting against your glutes. You will hopefully feel your glutes waking up, but they are not my biggest priority for you right now. As you do that squeeze outwards with the strap, make sure that your rib cage and lower back have not changed position from what you were doing beforehand. So for some people, they're going to squeeze out against the strap and pull that pelvis downwards and really shunt their lower back into the floor, lift their bottom slightly up off the floor, almost as if they're about to go up into a glute bridge. So we don't want that happening. And for other people, they'll squeeze out against the strap and they'll roll their pelvis forwards and stick their rib cage up into the sky. So we do not want either a posterior, which is the first one, or an anterior pelvic tilt as we do this. We want the pelvis to stay neutral and relaxed. We want the spine and the rib cage to be relaxed on the floor. We don't want them moving more into the floor or further away from the floor. Okay, maintaining what we call hip abduction. The next thing you're going to do is keep your big toe joints and the inner edges of your feet connected to the block. And I want you to try and spread your toes as wide apart from one another as possible. So spreading your toes wide apart from one another is not the same as taking your feet away from the block. You still try and keep your big toe joints in connection with the block, but you're trying to spread your toes um, like the active starfish hands that I sometimes speak about. Now, for some of you, spreading your toes is going to just feel impossible full stop. And that's okay. It's just something to work on and something to notice. You don't have very good toe function at the moment. And the next thing that we're going to do is once we've spread our toes, we're going to do a light pushing down through the fronts of our feet. And we're going to sustain that. So I'm going to walk you through this a little bit more, but we're going to hold this for five minutes. I call this constructive rest pose arch activation. This is a very subtle exercise. So it doesn't look like I'm doing very much. The knees, yes, they are squeezing out, but not excessively, a sort of two out of 10 level of effort. My biggest focus is trying to get the fronts of my feet, the balls of my feet, pushing down into the floor. My heels are not lifting off the floor, but it's almost as if they might, okay? So the toes spread wide. I want you to think about you being a little bullfrog with those spread um, so hands that they have, the webbed hands. And you're just trying to keep your toes long so they're not crunching up. The toes stay long, the toes stay wide, the toes stay flat, and you're pushing down through that front kind of third of your foot and you are just holding this. It's really subtle. So your palms are facing up, your hands, your arms, and your shoulders your, are all relaxed. You're maintaining calm, deep, diaphragmatic, nasal breathing. 
you're watching that the jaw isn't tensing up and you're watching that your neck isn't doing anything funky either. Upper body should feel relaxed. The rib cage isn't lifting. The lower back is staying on the floor. We are just doing a very gentle pushing down of the balls of the feet and the toes into the floor. The closer your feet are to your bottom, the easier that this is going to be to be able to do. So the further away your feet are, the more likely you are to roll your pelvis forwards and have an arch in your lower back, which we don't want. I want your lower back to be flat without you having to squeeze your abdominals to put it there. So have the feet close to you and just focus on those toes pushing down. And hopefully what you will start to feel is yes, you're going to hopefully feel like lateral hip work going on because of the strap that you're squeezing out. But you'll also hopefully start feeling things through the arches of your feet, maybe through your calves and shins, maybe. And it can actually also feed all the way up to the hamstrings and the glutes. If you're not feeling anything through your feet, you can practice taking your feet a little bit further away because that's going to put your feet into a greater degree of what we call plantar flexion. So that will create more demand through the feet, but I don't want your feet being too far away if that means that your lower back lifts up because that tells you that your lower back is compensating um, for a lack of plantar flexion. So that rib cage and lower back should still be soft and planted firmly into the ground but we're just squeezing down with those feet. And I'll answer obviously any questions at the end about this exercise, because I do appreciate it's a little bit confusing because until you get it, it can be difficult to do it. But then once you understand what you're sort of feeling for, you'll feel how all these weird things start coming alive through your feet and through your legs. So keep on breathing. We've got about another two minutes left here. Once again, the longer that I'm here for, I can sort of feel that my rib cage is settling. I've got a little bit of scoliosis in my spine and it sort of unwinds when I do this type of work. So it feels really good for me. And I'm continuing to feel how my right shoulder is changing. Every now and then I have to remind my toes to work. So the toes are trying to switch off. They're trying to be lazy and I have to kind of shake them a little bit, spread them out so they're far apart from each other and keep pushing down. You might want might wonder why we have the block there, but the block is there just to stop you from having your feet turned out like Charlie Chaplin. So it's just keeping your toes and your hips um, in alignment with one another, but the block isn't actually doing much more than serving as a sort of guidepost for you. Keeping the belly relaxed, keep breathing. Okay, I'm getting some quite strong stuff happening in my lateral hips now. I am actually finding this really difficult to switch on my toes today. I'm going to use the excuse that I'm so cold that they're about frozen off. But it is probably because I haven't done enough foot function stuff recently. We've got about 30 seconds left here. Remember, if you want to do this exercise again, you can experiment with having your feet further away. Okay, now I'm getting calf cramps, so I do have calves. Ah, um, so the, <laughs> when your feet are further away from you, you're putting more load through your ankles and plantar flexion, so the calves are going to kick on a bit more. And yes, I probably should have done this a bit sooner because I got immediate calf cramp, which is exciting for me. But my lower back is still flat and relaxed on the floor. I'm keeping my head and my jaw and my neck nice and relaxed. And that is our time. Okay. Oh, I'm still getting cramp. We're going to come into static wall next. And this is very much along the same line of the three exercises that we've done thus far. So static back, constructive rest pose, arch activation and static wall are all designed to get your head back over your shoulders whilst your shoulders are back over your pelvis, if that makes sense. So you're laying down on the floor, but we are going after that vertical stacking of your uh, load joints. Now we're gonna come into static wall and I'm gonna keep myself with the pillows, but it's up to you to decide whether or not you need them. But I think, especially in a neck pain class, let's take the pillow option because that is going to be the thing that really helps our rib cage relax off and therefore relax off our shoulders and neck too. So we're drawing our legs up to a wall like this. And I'm deliberately not going anywhere near as close to the wall as I can 
because I want to try and encourage you guys to do the same thing. So probably the biggest mistake in static wall is that people try and go too close to the wall when they don't flex through their hips and move through their pelvis and instead they move through their spine. So when we did static back, you felt how your knees were at that angle over the chair and you felt how your pelvis and your spine were all nice and relaxed, that should be the same sensation that you have when you put your legs up the wall. So if you go too close to the wall and you don't, you're not able to flex your hips, what will happen is, is your body will slightly tuck up and under in your pelvis and you'll be flexing your lower back like this. This is not what we want. Everything is flat. Your pelvis is flat on the floor. Spine is flat on the floor. The angle is your hips rather than it being in your back. Okay. We are pulling the tops of our feet back towards us. The toes, the ankles, the knees, and the hips are in the best alignment that they can be. Palms are facing up. Arms are out to the side. Keeping the breath calm and measured. Jaw is relaxed neck is relaxed and what I want you to do we're going to do this for two minutes before we start doing some shoulder exercises in it as well what I want you to do is also squeeze your quads so these are your quad muscles I want you to keep them tense and that's going to help feed into better hip flexion so your quads are your sort of secondary hip flexors they are helping you in this position but they are also the stronger they get they are also going to help you lengthen through tight hamstrings and calves with your feet make sure that the toes are not spinning out to the side and that you're keeping the outside edges of your feet in your mind as you do this. So lots of people won't dorsiflex their feet back towards them. They supinate. So they draw their big toes towards them and push the fifth toes away. I want you to make sure that your fifth toes and your big toes are as close to you, as close, sorry, are pulling back towards you evenly. So your big toes are not closer to you than your fifth toes are. Keep the quads tight. That's the thing that I always forget. I always forget about my quads. And hopefully you're going to start feeling some sort of heat and things going on through fronts of your shins. So this sustained period of dorsiflexion is waking up the tibialis anterior, which is the front of the shin muscle. Obviously, you're squeezing your quads. This is a great exercise for tibial torsion. It's a great exercise for um, restoring balance to the pelvis relaxing the spine, getting rid of um, thoracic rotation. But crucially here, we are putting the work into the areas of your body that means that your head is gonna be able to relax back over your shoulders when you stand back up at the end. I'm reducing my cushion now. Um, and if you had to, then perhaps you can do the same. Okay, so staying where we are, keeping your quads tight. So I always forget about my quads. So you have to keep reminding yourself about your quads, keeping those feet pulling back. Obviously you can take a break if your ankles and your legs get absolutely exhausted, but enjoy the fact that they're getting exhausted provided that you're maintaining that steady breath and that your neck and your jaws are not sort of tensing up. We're gonna take our hands into fists, take our elbows out to the side, and we're going to do some static wall reverse presses. So for reverse presses, what we are trying to do is to push our elbows, our upper arms in backwards down into the floor. So we're pushing down into the floor across the length of our left elbow, left upper arm, right upper arm and right um, elbow. We're holding for a beat and then we're relaxing off. So the movement is a pushing down into the floor, holding for a beat and relaxing off. Remember the quads, remember your feet. So we're layering two exercises on top of one another. As we do this pushing downwards into the floor with our active um, fist hands, we're not throwing our rib cage up off the floor. So some of you are gonna be trying to pop your rib cage up. That is not your shoulders moving. And that is probably one of the reasons why you might get neck tension. What we are trying to encourage here is the pushing back through the elbows, the upper arms and the shoulder blades, whilst we maintain that slightly double chinned position. 
We don't want the head creeping backwards and compressing on the neck because that's the neck trying to cheat for a lack of shoulder function. So this exercise is really tackling the two main um, sort of culprits of neck pain. We're working on our shoulder function and we're starting to kind of get a little bit of movement through the shoulder blades and the upper arms, but we're also working on the stability and the balance of our feet and our hips and our pelvis as well. So as we're doing this pushing back, it's not just the upper arms and the elbows that are pushing down into the floor. I also want you to try and draw your shoulder blades together and away from your ears. So there's a kind of movement of the muscles in between your shoulder blades that should wake up as well. It's not just the triceps, which are the rear arm muscles and the upper arm but it's also muscles in the kind of mid to upper back. So see if you can get your shoulder blades moving too. It's a subtle movement. It doesn't mean that it's not hard, but it's a subtle movement. But what it shouldn't be is your neck. So you shouldn't notice that you're stopping breathing or clenching down on your jaw or really, really, really tensing up your neck. Let's keep going nice and gently here. We're going to do about 20 seconds more of these. And I really want you to get into your mind how it feels when you've got that push down through both of the arms, but also the pulling back and down of the shoulders. So kind of visualize what it feels like when you're actively working. Remember your quads, pull back through the feet. And from here, keeping the feet and the quads tight, you're pushing down into the floor with your arms, you're pulling back and down with your shoulder blades and you're keeping that position locked. And we're slowly going to pivot our arms towards the floor. So this is what it looks like when we have fairly good range of movement at the shoulders. You can see here that I'm keeping a cactus position. My elbows are at 90 degrees. My shoulders are at um, 90 degrees. And I'm getting the backs of my wrists on the floor. For those of you who don't have very good shoulder mobility, what your body's going to try and do is you're gonna bend your wrists and you're gonna try and touch the floor with your knuckles. But what you're really aiming for is the wrists to be the thing that's touching the floor. So do be careful as we do these rotations, do be careful that your wrists are not bending. The wrists stay locked. What is moving is the upper arm within the shoulder socket. So we're starting to just utilize some of the muscles that when they get kind of locked up and frozen can really cause neck um, pain. So I'm keeping a sort of downward pressure through my upper arms. I'm pulling the shoulder blades back and down. I'm moving nice and slowly. I'm not pushing through pain. So if I had any kind of ouch sensations through my shoulder here, I wouldn't be um, fighting through it. I'm keeping my feet active. I'm keeping my quads active. I'm keeping my belly relaxed and I'm keeping my rib cage completely grounded throughout. So I'm not throwing my rib cage up and down to trick myself into thinking I'm moving my shoulders. The rib cage stays still, the back of the neck stays long, and I'm just slowly rotating my arms on this kind of 90 degree pivot point forwards and backwards. If you're doing it properly, you won't be able to touch the floor in front of you because in order for you to touch the floor in front of you, you're gonna lose the shoulder position. So if I touch the floor in front of me, my shoulders have really rounded up off the floor. And the intention of this exercise is that the shoulders are staying back and down behind us like they were in the reverse presses. So your maximum, when you're doing it properly, the maximum amount that your arms are gonna move forwards is probably about this sort of 45 degree angle, but they should, be able to touch the floor behind, but I don't want you getting overly competitive because these things take time. And the more that you're trying to crank your hands down to the floor, the more likely you are to bend your wrists or flare your rib cage up or compensate through your neck. We just want this to be a kind of pleasant amount of burning and working around the upper arms and the shoulders. It's not a super intense exercise, but like I said, it's difficult to coordinate and we don't want super intense shoulder exercises because probably lots of you are drawn here because you're in pain in your neck. And if I gave you super intense shoulder exercises, your neck would complain at you. Okay, we're gonna do about five more seconds here and then we're gonna do our final exercise before we finish tonight. Okay, good job. 
So our final exercise is lying supine with towels and block. So for this, we're going to put that block. This is kind of similar to what we did when we did the constructive rest pose arch cramp. But we're going to put the block on the wall the tall way. And we're going to put our feet either side of it. And this is where we need our towels. So we're going to roll up a towel and put one underneath our lower back. And the feet, you don't have to have your feet on the wall, but it, the using the wall is a very good way of making sure that your feet don't cheat um, because you'll be able to feel if you're supinating rather than dorsiflexing your feet. And then the other towel goes underneath my lower back like so. So I'm laying supine. And when I'm laying supine with my feet in this dorsiflexion position, if you imagine that I was standing upright, you can see I've got like this perfect upright posture. So imagine my body flipped up and I'm standing. My ankles, sorry, my pelvis would be back over my ankles. My shoulders would be back over my, ah, I've knocked over a plant. My shoulders would be back to over my pelvis and my head would be back over my shoulders. So this is a brilliant exercise for teaching your body how to load correctly. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in this exercise. This is a tough, top to toe exercise. We are going to spend five minutes here, but unfortunately, just lying in this position is not the exercise. There is some work to be done. So similarly to what we just did in that static wall, I want you to pull your feet back towards you. So this is why the wall is really, really helpful because you can have your heels against the wall, but I want you to pull the tops of your feet back towards you. So that's making sure that you're maintaining that dorsiflexion and that you're not starting to plant to flex your feet as you get tired. And you're gonna squeeze your inner edges of your feet into the block nice and gently. And that's all in inverted commas we have to do. So I've set the timer. The only part of your body here that is actively doing anything is your feet, but hopefully you will start to feel all sorts of strange reactions and things going on as you start to loosen up a little bit in this exercise. So first things first, let's tune into our neck and our jaw, okay? Are you clamping down on your jaw and holding your breath? Or are you staying nice and chilled in that upper body as you ask the feet to work? Relax the breath, relax the belly, palms are facing up, arms are out sort of 45 degrees to the side the feet pull back towards you. So your heels are further away from your body than your toes and the fronts of your feet are. You're not just pulling your toes back towards you. So the balls of the feet shouldn't be against the wall right now. The balls of the feet should be away from the wall while the heels are on it. And you're squeezing into the block with the inside edges of both of your feet. It's the feet that are actively working, but hopefully soon enough, you will start feeling your, well, you'll probably start feeling your shins and your calves kind of quite quickly, but then you might start noticing that it's starting to kind of creep up into your inner thighs and the fronts of your thighs. You may then also start noticing it starts moving into the outer thighs and things like that. But we are basically using the feet to completely alter the alignment of the legs, the alignment of the hips and pelvis. And then this then really frees up the upper body. So my right shoulder is letting go once again. I can feel my rib cage kind of trying to sort itself out a little bit. I like to sort of fidget and move in these types of exercises just to reset my body once it's realigned. Keep breathing, keep calm, notice that neck. So if your neck is trying to take over, your options are don't try quite so hard with your feet. So it might be a question of reducing how much you're trying to pull them back or how much you're trying to squeeze in. And then your other option is perhaps try a cushion rather than trying just the roll. So the reason that we like the rolls and it's slightly different to what the cushion does the roll gives your neck support and your lower back support, but it's helping to restore the curvature of the spine that we're trying to encourage. With the cushion, like we used it earlier, 
that is more helping you relax your rib cage and your upper body rather than it actually being the correct spinal curvature. So we want you to have an arch in your lower back, a little one, and we want you to have a little bit of a kind of um, curve in the cervical spine, the neck. Relaxing hands, relaxing arms. I'm starting to get a little bit wobbly through my legs now. The shins are burning. You can take as many breaks here as you need, but we're going to do another two minutes before we finish. We've only done five minutes in total, but on the Agoski Method software, they can. Uh, this gets kind of automatically put into people's menus at 12 minutes, which is torturous. And for those of you who have signed up for the Posture Revolution or who are doing the Posture Revolution at the moment, this is one of the week's kind of bonus homeworks. And it's an amazing exercise. It's really giving you a lot of things here. So we're getting dorsiflexion of the feet, which is a much neglected range of movement um, for most people because of the terrible trainers uh, and the shoes that they wear. So it's really like lengthening you through the backs of your calves and hamstrings, which is one thing. It's stretching your hips off into extension. So for those of you with tight hips, we are getting those hips into extension. It's creating better pelvic balance through the work that your legs are doing, but also by having that um, towel underneath your lower back. It's reducing rib cage rotation, which it definitely, definitely does to me because it comes back down to what I mentioned at the beginning with that lower left foot, um, sorry, lower left leg, which I know causes a bit of a twist in my rib cage. And it's opening out the shoulders, it's opening out the um, arms, and it's also putting that neck in a nice supported position where as the spine changes due to all the other changes that are happening further downstream, you might notice that your neck gets kind of more and more relaxed, I would hope. You might notice that your neck gets more and more tense, which tells you that your body is just not functional enough for this exercise at the moment. The hip extension can be quite challenging for people. Um, so if you're doing this and actually you just feel like your lower back is perhaps getting really tense or you're just locking on with your hands, your arms and your neck, leave this one out. But I feel like the rest of the exercises that we've done so far um, will be good ones to practice. Um, but you do need a, probably a little bit more hip extension if this is elevating your levels of pain. And there we have it. We've done our five minutes there. So I'm going to stop. I'm hoping that you had some uh, shin burning and things going on. And if not that, but some shakiness through your legs. And then just making your way nice and slowly back up to standing. Let's just tune into how we feel having done those how many exercises did we do one two three four five but then we had those two shoulder exercises when we we're in static wall so shaking our tension and just tuning into a comparison as to how you felt at the start so am i in pain am i in tension do i feel any sort of difference with balance through my feet from left to right but also front to back and also really tune into that positional change. So especially because we've done this as a sort of neck focus class today, does your head and your shoulders feel any further back? Do you feel like your maybe arms are a bit more balanced? I definitely feel quite different, especially in my lower body. But I feel like I probably need a little bit more work in my upper body to release my right shoulder. But the rest of me actually feels very, very good. I'm almost sort of more aware of the fact that my right shoulder feels a bit stuck. But 